get back It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a beach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. So I was chatting with a friend, colleague, Dan Fagella, and asking him what other great guests I should have on, and he wrote to me, Amit has some pretty insane experiences in scaling a company, $11 million uh, business in something like two to three years, and he's been nice to me and helped me grow my business over the last several months. Uh, Today, we have Amit Mehta. He's founder of Boost Software that he grew from zero to $11.6 million within three years. He wrote the book from zero to $12 million to bust. I, I hardly, like when I was reading that chapter, I was like, wait, is this bust thing right? And the subheadline, which I love, is Inc. 5000 CEO reveals how to avoid these nine hidden traps that can destroy your business. At the end, he'll tell you where you can, you can either buy it or he's actually generous enough to, to give it away for people to read it because it's so valuable. You know, and before the call, he just casually mentions, oh yeah, I had this $6 million blogging business, by the way, and um, he also co-founded 10xgrowthhacker.com where he runs growth hacking workshops showing startups how they scale growth through unorthodox marketing strategies. Amit, thanks for joining me. Great to be here, Jeremy. Thanks for having me on. The challenge was decisions we made a year ago were coming back to haunt us. Hmm. Because when you have, the bigger your company gets, the more delay there is on decision making. So like when you have a $10 million company, a decision you make now will come back and bite you in the ass 18 months from then. Hmm. So there's a delayed effect. So what happened in 2013, we're rolling in money and you're like, hey, my business partner decided, hey, let's take a bunch of money out of the company and buy homes. We started paying ourselves like massive distributions. We thought, hey, we made it. This gravy train is going to go on for years. Let's uh, let's enjoy a little, you know. We worked hard for all these years. Let's Sounds take some good. Money out. Yeah. And uh, so I, I bought a house. My business partner bought a house, and uh, we we just took uh, probably like a million dollars a piece out of the company yeah. that year. Uh, and so and, and so what happened was, you know, obviously the sales plunged at the end of the year because we lost that one source, and uh, they plunged uh, so badly. Uh, that we had to take all the savings that we had saved for taxes to make payroll and cover cover invoices, invoice payments. Wow. To the point, uh, come next April, we didn't have enough money to pay for taxes. Mm. Wow. So we had to borrow $600,000 from the bank, Wow. personally guarantee it, to, uh, to make our tax payments. So then, so what happened was... We, and then the bank was like, you know, you screwed up. You took too much money out of the company. You, you jeopardized. You basically like gutted your company. And so we're going to make you pay this back in a 10-month uh, period. Jeez. So $60,000 a month. I'm surprised they even gave you the money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Actually. They gave you the money too. <laughs> <laughs> so $60,000 a month. Um, um, also... Um, our, we were running like at, like we had good months and then we had like some weird shit happen in 2014. Like we had a super affiliate who was doing 300 sales a day. He suddenly disappeared. He got banned by Google. Apparently he was doing some things that were violating Google's terms of service. Uh, we found out about it. And by the time we found out about it, he got banned by Google. We lost all those sales. Wow. Uh, and then uh, what else happened? Yeah, so uh, we hired an agency to handle our AdWords account. And this is all while we're, you know, we're, if we hadn't had to pay the six hundred, uh, the $60,000 a month and had these weird, weird shit happen, we would have been fine. It could be your partner calling because he's on, off the train. It's, it's, no. a, it's, a, it's one of my clients. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I, could tell him I, I couldn't make it. Uh, so anyway, so, so we had $60,000 a month. So we're, we're barely like breaking even paying the $60,000 a month to the bank. Uh, lost one of our major affiliates, so we took a little bit of a dip there and hired this agency 
that told us, hey, we're going to have handle your AdWords account, no problem, you're going to be in good shape. Uh, they wrecked our AdWords account and uh, uh, drove our spend up to $30,000 a day with no additional sales. Whoa. Luckily, I caught it right away. Jeez. And so basically, it was a $100,000 crane wreck. Because I had to spend seventy grand to get the Google account back to profitability because I rebuilt the whole thing from scratch. And the way you build like a Google account, like you have to lose money in the beginning to kind of get the good placements. And so, so we lost hundred thousand dollars there. Lost a bunch of money because we lost his affiliate because he did some stupid shit and got banned by Google. Um, I don't even know if it was our account because he had like twenty different accounts. So I think he was doing something shady on some other account, and he, they banned all of his accounts. Wow. He's like promoting like toolbars on another account that was connected to our account, and so they pretty much shut him down. Jeez. So that happened, and and on top of paying sixty thousand dollars a month. And then we're okay, so we we had to. I think we had to borrow some money from one of our vendors. We borrowed some money, and then uh, we reformulated our strategy. We're like, okay, we need to go international. That's where the opportunity is. So we did a little pivot, and we shifted our efforts to doing international. Uh, we had some other channels that were starting to improve, so we were on the upswing. And uh, that was around uh, October. And then November, we got sued by the Federal Trade Commission. Add fuel to the fire. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's... Yeah, sued by the Federal Trade Commission. They, they shut down our company. Literally came in, shut down our company, had a court order, shut down our company. We, we had to turn off our order processor. Wow. We couldn't take a single, we couldn't even process orders. They could do whatever they want at this yeah, point. They have like pretty much police state power. They can do whatever they want. And uh, they came in, they shut down our company and said, uh, uh, they hired some expert who said our software was bogus. Like this is a software we'd spend $500,000, sweat, blood and tears producing. Right. They said it was just making up stuff. Like it wasn't real. And we're like, this is ridiculous. This is completely false. So we had, and then on top of that, we had 10 days to fight them in court to uh, overturn this uh, injunction against our company. So literally, I got a legal team together of like 10 people, like literally working around the clock. And this, the invoice turned out to be like 200 grand. Jeez. A 10 day period. Basically, we hired a, an expert who wrote 17 books on Windows to prove our, our product was real. Uh, our legal team, we made an amazing case. We got all the cu customer testimonies together, um, all types of information, facts, figures, information to, to show in the court. And our, our expert witness was doing a full analysis of the program, showing, hey, it worked. And the, the claims that the, the FTC made and their pinhead expert witness made were false. Let me turn off my phone here. Give me a second. And so we, we went in court. It was amazing. It was like... And, you know, my attorney said, hey, you know, this real court cases aren't like Matlock or these TV shows. They're actually really boring. It was not boring. Why? <laughs> it was easy. Because the way it was set up, it was no, it, it wasn't, it, it was just basically a judge. Because just a preliminary injunction trial. It was basically a judge and no jury. And they skipped all the, the testimonies and everything. It was all written. All the deposition and the, and the, and the testimonies were all written. So we went right, it went right to cross-examination. So the whole case, the entire day, was all cross-examination. Wow. And it was like a movie. It was like something out of a movie. It was incredible. Yeah, tell me about it. What, what it... Probably like one of the most you know, amazing experiences in my life. Scariest, but amazing experiences in my life. Um, so at one point, there was a funny scene where um, the FTC attorney comes up to me and says, Hey, you know... Um, like, so you went down to see this call center. Like, the whole case was surrounded around the practices at the call center that, you know, we were working with this call center, one of, like, 20 clients. They're all, it was all focused on this call center on, and our software as well. Our software, we pretty much basically demolished their case. We proved that our software was real and that their, their expert witness was full of shit. Our expert, their expert witness had to actually recant during cross-examination, my attorney tore him apart, had to recant and admit our software was real. Yeah. And so it was, it was pretty amazing. And um, wow. there was some high fives going around <laughs> after that. And so anyway, so it was this funny scene where the FTC attorney, uh, I'm, I'm on, um, he's cross-examining me. You're on me. the stand. I'm on the stand. Yeah. 
And he's like, have you been down to, you've been down to the call center, right? Yeah, yes. Yeah, it's like, been down to the call center. Did you, did you go to like one of the call center owners? Did you go to this guy's office and, and see what he had in his wall? I'm like, what do you mean? He had pictures of, of uh, Scarface and all these mob movies and, and Godfather up there. So you're telling me you thought these guys were legit when they had pictures of mob movies on their wall? <laughs> <laughs> so basically, they're saying like, so basically, if you like mob movies, you're some kind of criminal or something. I'm like, what the hell? That was their defense. And so you say, what do you say to that? I didn't say that. I'm like, I just said, hey, just because he likes mob movies doesn't make him a criminal, you know? That's nuts. <laughs> so it was, it was just crazy. And so like when when they're attacked against our software basically fell apart they started coming up with new stuff like oh well we don't like the fact your 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 registry you're checking this registry entry we don't think that's that useful compared to these other ones that you're scanning for and they're like really like technical like bizarre stuff like they just kind of came up with that grasping at straws at this point they're just grasping at straws so so basically we, we we won that it was a slam dunk we won the preliminary injunction but the thing is that that's just a preliminary injunction. That's just to overturn getting our company shut down. So we've got our company turned back on. And then there's another trial that's supposed to go on, where the real trial, which costs like millions of dollars. Now, remember, we were in a fragile financial situation at the moment. Right. Uh, getting our company shut down for three weeks basically completely wrecked our company. So we were like, like, like our... We had our nose above the water, you know, <laughs> just like staying afloat barely. Right. And we're like on the upswing and then we got sued and then shut down our company for three weeks. Huge legal expenses, so couldn't pay our bills. So none of our vendors, our advertisers would turn us off. Like, dude, you owe us like hundreds of thousands of dollars, pay up or we're never gonna work with you again. And we're like, right. dude, we got all the money. We just got our, we just got food barred by the government. You know? <laughs> So we couldn't turn any of our traffic on, and I had to lay off our entire staff. Jeez. Like, first week of December. Like, developers, everyone? Everyone. Wow. It sucked. I had to lay off everyone, including myself. Including myself. And then, uh, because we had a company in Poland, they they have uh, they have, like, eight weeks of severance or six weeks of severance. So I had to pay 80 grand to... Uh, to pay the severance in Poland. Otherwise, Mariusz, our director there, would have been personally liable for that. And wow. that would have wiped him out. Holy cow. So. Jeez. What a tough decision. So we won, but we actually lost. And now I'm, I'm trying to settle with the FTC because I don't want to spend a million dollars fighting them in court. I'd like to have a million dollars right now. And so because I'm settling with them, I have to agree to uh, these ridiculous uh, restrictions on what I can do. I can never promote a PC optimizer again in any way or form. So, at the, at you the, know, so, so there's no repercussions, Amit, for the government for doing that, for falsely accusing a business and shutting them, essentially shutting their business down for a period of time, which puts them out of business. What people don't realize is federal agencies have Gestapo powers. Yeah. They can go in and do crazy shit and wreck your business um, in a snap of a finger, and you have literally no recourse. Hmm. Like, all you can do is beg for mercy. Jeez. You know, it's it's, <laughs> it's like something out of the medieval period, you know? I mean, it's crazy. It is. That's crazy. And, and you, know, you, you know, usually, like, people historically thought the FTC, like, usually they go after people, the type of people that wake up every day and think about how they're, they're trying to cheat their customers, you know? Right. Now we're going after companies over technicalities. Like companies, like we had no intention of cheating anybody. We're trying to do the right thing. We're actually we're trying to like one of the things that we always focus on compliance and improving the compliance of our build and and because that was a big thing in our industry. And so we were actually striving to produce better and better products and provide more value. Yeah. And we still got nailed. I'm so just... now I'm like super vigilant about everything I do because. Yeah. Like, if you have a testimony on your website and if it's not properly disclosed about what type of connection you have with them, then you could literally be shut down to the FTC. They can freeze your bank account. They can shut down your business and they can wreck your entire life in the yeah. snap of a finger because yeah. you didn't follow their uh, ridiculously uh, uh, complex rules for, uh, for you know, for advertising and, and what have you. I'm just, I'm smiling because I'm like, who around the boardroom table is like, 
let's go after this PC optimizer company. Like, yeah, <laughs> that sounds like a sexy business we should like take down. Yeah, <laughs> crazy. So That's you know, on the flip side of things, what what was the proudest moment of the company? I mean, a lot of challenges, a lot of hard times, a lot of low points that you had to deal with because of all these factors. But what was one of the proudest moments? I think it was in 2013 when we, when we actually were were growing and we had a we actually brought the whole team together for the first team meeting, and uh, my business partner and I we sat down and we told stories about like all the stuff we went through to build a company and yeah. we created this amazing vision. We all met at my um, my place in the city, and that was probably my proudest moment. Like yeah. when we actually had finally made it, we'd gotten to the point where we had this amazing team, we created great things, and we had a great future ahead of us. Yeah. And that's probably my proudest moment. So oh, there's other things that happened too. Uh, yeah. In 2014, that made things 10 times harder. Not only was I dealing with all this bad stuff happening in 2014, my business partner completely checked out that year. Like he took the entire month. He decided like when the company was losing $5,000 a day, he was going to go adopt a child. Wow. And disappear for a month. And I'm like, dude, like we're losing $5,000 a day. I kind of need your help. And boom, he was gone kind of checked out of the company and uh, I had to basically run the whole company on myself. That's why I was under tremendous stress in 2014. Yeah. That's to put it lightly. What I, think you... just, I think he just cracked under the pressure because yeah. it was a lot of pressure. Yeah. You know, like you were saying, like writing a bar to deck. I mean, it yeah. was a lot of pressure. So what made you write the book? Most people are like, Hey, I'm done with this. I don't want to think about it. I want to talk about it. And then you detail a lot of these challenges and really low points, hard times that most people don't even want to talk about in your book, you know, from zero to 12 million to bust. What made you decide to write the book? I think I, it, I think my story was important enough. I had to share it. I mean, it is important, but, but important enough. It still means you have to put these low points and challenges and hard times and think about them and then actually put them on paper. Well, I think that process was actually kind of healing, you know, it Just, was, just getting out in paper and yeah. kind of helped me put it behind me. Jeez. I mean, and, and also it was an educational experience for me. I, I wanted to learn everything I could from the experiences I had. Yeah. Cause it was, it was a decamillion dollar learning experience. <laughs> it was a, an education was school of hard knocks. Seriously. You know, I have one last question. I want you to talk about what you're working on now. But before I do, just tell people, let's point people, where can they find out more? Where should they um, check out the book and in any other places? Yeah, if you want to grab a free copy of the book, you go to ProfitSwami.com. That's ProfitSwami.com. And you can grab a free copy. Um, or you can go to Amazon and, and, and type in, you know, from zero to 12 million to bust. And you can buy a copy. I think it's nine ninety seven. Yeah. And then what you're working on now? I'm working on a couple things. I'm working with, uh, you know, I'm taking on a couple uh, selected uh, clients I'm working with and uh, who, who want to who help, you know, grow, growing and scaling the company based on, you know, my experience of everything I've done. Yeah. And I'm also uh, launching a workshop called uh, the 10X Growth Hacker Workshop here in Boston. And I'm working with a guy named Dimitri from a blog called Criminally Prolific. Mm-hmm. And so we're teaming up. He's a wizard at PR and SEO, and I'm good at paid search. So, and we're bringing on two other guys who are good at uh, uh, t- to also teach at the workshop. And one guy is a wizard at B2B lead generation. The other guy is a master at email. So we've got a lot of different mm. angles and strategies covered. Yeah. And so uh, it's going to be it's going to be very different than any other workshop that's been done in the uh, in the startup world. In the sense that we're gonna limit participation only 30 people and we're going to give a lot of one-on-one uh, we're going to go through everyone's business mm. on a on pretty much like everyone goes up presents their business and we're going to tear it apart and kind of create a blueprint for them mm. and then even follow up with them to help them make sure they execute the blueprint the growth strategy of uh, the 10x growth hacker blueprint that we're going to build for them and then execute that and help them grow their company, you know? And this yeah. is, we're not gonna take any equity from anyone or anything, but it's just gonna be a high level personalized attention. And this is for the companies that, you know, can't afford to hire a growth hacking consulting and pay tens of thousands of dollars, right. but want that level of attention and personalization to, to help their specific company 
you know, build a growth strategy that's going to help them grow. Yeah. So basically, these people come, you'll have, a, you'll have a, a panel, a team of experts, basically giving people all the strategies and the blueprint in that yeah. portion of their company so that they kind of get a whole yeah. full circle view to, to build their company. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we're going to look at their business, each, everyone's business. And what's going to be kind of cool is that like the, everyone in the audience is going to see as we develop strategies for one, one business after another. Yeah. So you can be sitting in the audience and you, like maybe we haven't talked about your business yet, but you'll see how, you know, uh, the other guy's business, how we built a strategy for him. And you're going to learn the whole process of growth hacking in a very deep way. Mm hmm. So people can check that out at 10xgrowthhacker? Yeah, 10xgrowthhacker.com. Dot com. Got it. You know, I mean, I really appreciate you being so open and share. It's rare that someone is so open about everything in their business and from the ups to the, to the downs. And it's, it's really super valuable to hear about this so that, you know, people can learn uh, of what things they should be doing or not doing. Yeah. Um, what should we leave people with to end? If you were to, to, you know, we talked about a lot of different things, challenges, ups and downs. What, um, what message should we leave them with? Yeah, I don't know if, uh, if anyone in the audience has ever read the book, uh, 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 Master Key to Riches by Napoleon Hill. They talk about the, uh, the process of, um, of, of facing failure. Hmm. Failure is really not fail. I don't consider it failure. I consider it a stepping stone to success because a lot of the the greatest tycoons and, and successful people in history that Napoleon Hill associated with, like Andrew Carnegie and stuff like that, all of them at one point or another faced like tremendous failure in their life, and um, and that was a big key for their success because what hmm. failure does is it breaks down all those habits, the failure habits that you might have had. And it allows you to reformulate new habits, new success habits to, to help you, you know, go to the next level. Because sometimes you got to face failures to kind of break those those patterns that you're in that are that are causing the failures to begin with. You know, mm -hmm. got to kind of hit hit those uh, hit those brick walls before you can bust through them. Right, right. And so I think that's it's a very it's it's Master Key to Riches by Napoleon Hill. So I highly recommend everyone yeah. read that book. Yeah, it's very powerful. It talks the power of you know of what I talk about faith about you know after my company, after my business went uh, my affiliate business went to zero, I kept going and didn't go back to a job. It talks about the power of faith, power of uh, you know overcoming failures and uh, power of persistence, positive mental attitude. Yeah. Amit, thank you so much. Everyone should check out ProfitSwami.com and 10xGrowthHacker.com. It's been an absolute pleasure. Awesome. Thanks, Amit. Thanks. Appreciate it. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. 